Well, let's take our Bibles, please. And we're actually going to go to Matthew chapter 11. This is the companion reading of Luke chapter 7. Uh, but there's some details here in Matthew that we're going to look at. Uh, Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to read this morning from verse uh, number 1 through verse number 11. And the message title this morning is When Faith Falters. When your faith falters. In Matthew chapter 11, verse number 1. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went you out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Father, thank you for your precious word and the encouragement that it brings. Lord, we are grateful for your faithfulness to us. Your promises are always true. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see through the cloud this morning, that we might see the sun shining and the blue skies. Help us to realize the smile of God upon us today. And Lord, wherever we might be this morning, some I'm sure are maybe on the mountaintop while others are in the valley. But Lord, we pray that all of us would hear your sweet voice. And Lord, that you will touch us and help us. For we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, we preached on the little foxes that spoil the vines. And really, the vines of the Christian life are beautiful and they're wonderful. The Christian life is the best life that anyone could ever live. And it's absolutely the truth. <clears throat> and I know what it was to live as a young person, not as a Christian, not seen. And I can tell you there's a great difference like night and day. But you know something? The Christian life, there are times in the Christian life when nothing makes sense. There are times when God allows things to come into your life that are not only unwelcome, but they're unexpected. And you can be shocked and many times dismayed at the experiences that you may go through in your lifetime. Now, I'm grateful that for the believer, it's mostly not all like that. But there are times when there are great trials. And of course, the Lord warned us of such times. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, and I'm glad he called us beloved because we are loved. But he said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, we get into those days when things, strange things are happening and we just, we, we don't know, we don't know what's going on. And we, we are surprised and we're shocked. And yet the scripture says that that too is the land of the children of God. You see, there are often times in our lives when life gets messy. We don't like messy things. We, need, we like it clean cut. We, need, we, we like everything under control. We like things that are uh, clear and sure and uh, uh, where everything is going the way we want it to go. And there are just times in life when that's unrealistic and it's not going to happen that way. And we question when these times come, questions arise in our heart. 
because it is exactly at those times that God seems to be distant. Where is he? I can't find him. I can't feel him. I can't hear him. And I don't understand why God is allowing these things to take place. And I certainly wasn't expecting this. My friend, that's going to happen. It has already happened in your life. And it will happen again. And there are even times as believers when our faith may falter. We can be greatly discouraged. Even to the point where we would look to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand. I, 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 I do not know why. And why me? I know we can say, well, why not me? And we understand the, the grounds of the truth of the word of God that we're all born outside the garden and, and we are, we're all going to face those things. We're in enemy territory. And we understand the theology of all that. But there are times when life will not make sense to you. And there are many examples of this in the scripture when God's children had more questions than answers and they were confused and they were weak and emotionally they were at their wit's end. You realize that that's where the, the Bible is where that phrase comes from. They're, they came to their wit's end. They were at their wit's end. We can think of Job this morning. Job was a godly man. He was a righteous man. And God used him as an example before Satan. Before long, Job lost his possessions. And he was a very wealthy man. He lost everything. And more importantly than that, he lost all of his children. And one day they all died. Lost his family. And even his wife turned to Job and said, Dost thou retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Job, Job was alone with his troubles. In Job 10 verse 15 he said to God, I am full of confusion. Therefore see thy mine affliction. Lord, do you not see me? And you know, Job did keep his integrity. And he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And yet, he didn't know why. If you knew why, it probably wouldn't be a trial. Job experienced those days. I want to look at uh, Psalm 73 for just a moment. And I'll, I'll try to hurry through this, but just to give you some examples of this. But they're very important examples. Um, Psalm 73 is... Uh, Really a sister passage to Psalm 37. 37, 73, just to put the numbers backwards. But in Psalm 73, the psalmist Asaph also had a problem. He had questions. And it's a wonderful psalm. It's about the prosperity of the wicked. Not the prosperity of the godly. In fact, if you look down here at verse number 12 through 16, he says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. This doesn't make any sense. In verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I, I have, have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He says, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm trying to be right. I'm trying to do right. And I have problem after problem after problem. And Job Lowe over here, he's a wicked man. And everything he touches turns to gold. It's, he prospers. And Lord, I don't understand this. It seems to me like it's back to front. And then he says in verse number 15, he says, if I say I will speak thus. He says, you know, I'm embarrassed even to, to voice what I'm thinking. If I told my... Uh, brothers and sisters and the Lord, uh, the things that were in my heart. He says, if I would speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Nobody would understand what I'm saying. They would just say, well, you're just a better person. He says in verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. There are inner turmoils and contradictions, seeming contradictions and questions where we just don't understand what's going on. Asaph was one. You experience those things. Look over at Matthew chapter. You're in Matthew 11. I want you to keep your place there. But go uh, across to Matthew 14. And verse 26. Now what I'm just illustrating. There's many, many. This is not something that. Just you will experience. It is the common experience of all believers. And all through the scripture. We find many examples. Of God's children. When they had more questions than answers. 
and their faith was faltering. And in Matthew 14, we read about Peter in verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea. By the way, Jesus did walk on the sea. It wasn't shallow. Do you know how deep the Sea of Galilee is? If you go out there on the boat, I mean, it just shelves down like this. 150 feet deep out there. There's no stepping stones. He was walking on the sea. But they were troubled. If you saw somebody walking on the sea, you'd be troubled too. And they said, it is a spirit. They thought he was a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. You know, when Jesus says you don't have to be afraid, then you really don't have to be afraid. He says, Be of good cheer, it's me. Don't be afraid. Now, verse 28 is wonderful. You know, Jesus wasn't the only person who walked on water. In verse 28, Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. You know, Jesus loves a challenge like that when people are up for a challenge and they want to step out of the boat and they want to exercise faith. Jesus doesn't say, no, no, don't get out of the boat. He said, come on. And so Jesus said in verse 29, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter also walked on the water to go to Jesus. But there was a problem. Look at verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, said unto him, O thou of little faith, where didst thou, therefore, wherefore didst thou die? You know, if he hadn't doubted it, he probably had walked all the way to Jesus. What, what was it that made him doubt? Well, he looked around. He probably felt himself going up and down because it was a storm. It wasn't flat water. And so the waves were carrying him up as he's walking on it. And the wind is blowing and he sees the waves and all of a sudden he realizes the boat's back here and, and I'm out here. And he starts to sing. And then look over at the Gospel of John chapter 11. There was three in the city of Bethany, the little family of Martha and Lazarus and Mary. Jesus, Bethany is just outside Jerusalem and Jesus was up in Galilee and they sent for him because Lazarus was sick. He whom thou lovest is sick. And they knew that Jesus would come. And they knew that Jesus would heal him. But you know what Jesus did? He stayed there in Galilee for two more days. And then he traveled two days. In fact, he waited in Galilee until Lazarus had died. And then he took two days to come, come down to Bethany. And I want you to look at the reading in verse number 32 of chapter 11. He comes to Bethany to meet, first of all, Martha and then Mary. In verse 32, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet. Mary was always at the feet of Jesus, but she fell down in overwhelming grief. But not only overwhelming grief. Because everybody's going to die. But the fact is that Jesus had disappointed. Because he had time to get there. And she said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. It's one of those, what if? If only. If this had happened or if that had been different, then he wouldn't have died. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Martha and Mary had more questions than answers. Lord, why weren't you here? Why? How could this happen? And then if you look over John chapter 20, the worst thing that ever could have imagined in the disciples' hearts was the fact that the Messiah, the King of Israel, who they knew was the Messiah, they knew was the King of Israel. And then Jesus, three years into the ministry, he said to them one day, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem. He will suffer many things of the scribes and Pharisees, and they will put him to death. And Peter took him aside and said, Lord, be it far from you. What are you talking about? You're the king of Israel. All the Old Testament prophecies of your kingdom must be fulfilled. What do you mean you're going to die? But he did die. 
and the consternation and the trouble and the trial and the, the questions that came into the minds of the disciples when Jesus actually died upon the cross, you cannot imagine what was going through their hearts. And in John chapter 20 and verse number 19, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. You see, they were not in any mood to concoct any kind of resurrection story. They were down and defeated and depressed and with no hope. And they were in the upper room and they locked the doors in case they were going to come and take them and kill them as well. They were af afraid for their lives. And all of a sudden the doors being shut, the doors being locked, and Jesus appears in the midst of them. <laughs> Verse 19. It says, <clears throat> And came Jesus, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Well, that would be the thing you would need to say. Shalom alakim. Peace be unto you. Because they were just like, what? Scared out of their minds, I would imagine. They think he's a ghost. He says, I'm not a spirit. A spirit hath no flesh and bones as you see me have. Come and touch me, handle me. He says he got anything to eat and he ate before them. He was in a physical body. Yet his physical body walked through a wall. A, a solid wall, the door's been shut. And if you look down, please, at verse 24 of John chapter 20. We read these words. In verse 24 and verse 25, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not there uh, with them when Jesus came. So on that first Sunday, uh, I don't know where he was, but Thomas wasn't there in the upper room. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, they said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands at the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. I'm saying this to say this, that the faith of the disciples faltered. They didn't understand what was going on. They were confused about what was going on until Jesus showed up. And then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord? Because in that moment, they just said, peace be still, peace I look And it was all over. And Jesus solved the problem. Of course, Thomas wasn't there. And so Jesus shows up a week later. And down in verse number 27, then said he to Thomas, reach other thy finger and behold my hands and reach other thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Amen. <laughs> you think Tom, we call him doubting Thomas, but they all doubted. And they all fled from him. And uh, <clears throat> it wasn't just Peter that denied the Lord. They all fled from the Lord. And it wasn't just Thomas that didn't believe. They all didn't believe until they saw the evidence. How was Thomas's faith doing in that week? Well, it wasn't very good. By the way, God likes skeptics because a, a, a skeptic is someone who's a genuine skeptic, wants the truth. He's asking the questions. I demand to see evidence. <clears throat> you know, God doesn't want you just to believe anything. You have to believe in the truth. And so there has to be evidence. And so he demanded evidence. And so Jesus says, well, I'm going to give you evidence. What I'm saying is that these Christians were going through some great trials and testings of their faith. Christians are not perfect. You're not perfect. And your life is not perfect. And our experience is not all... Um, you know, unicorns and rainbows, as they say. Um, it's not a bed of flowers. And if the Lord doesn't come for us soon, and if we don't die soon, between now and the time we meet the Lord, there will be, there will be trouble ahead. There is trouble ahead. There, there are trials and troubles and times with no answers and bewilderments and failures in your life and mine. But our security does not depend on us having it all together. And having all the answers. My security doesn't depend on my perseverance. Now, believers should persevere. We should have that ability to keep on keeping on. But your, your security and your salvation does not depend upon you keeping it and hanging on and pressing onwards, that's not what's going to save you or keep you safe. 
but it is all dependent upon his preservation. There's a difference between perseverance and preservation. Perseverance is what you can do. Preservation is what he does. It's not you holding on to him. It's him holding on to you. And it's based upon him and his nature and his work and his promises. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. You don't save yourself. You don't deliver yourself. But there's one who does love you. Somebody loves me. Somebody cares. Amen. That somebody is Jesus. Amen. And he loves you this morning. Right. And I want you to notice that in all those stories, in the, in the midst of all of those confusing situations, Job and Asaph and Peter and Martha and Mary and the disciples, and all of those stories in the midst of despair, when you continue the story, it all ends well. Christ made everything right in the end. Paul said, for the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Yeah. See, when I first got saved, I thought to myself, you know, I was really weighing up what's really important. And the thing that came to my mind at that moment was, you know, I could not get saved and live a, a life of debauchery and pleasure and everything that man, that the word could give me. Uh, for say 70 years and then die and go to hell forever or I could get saved and it could be the worst life in the world and I could be ridiculed and laughed at and mocked and and suffer persecution for 70 years and then die and go to heaven Amen. forever and I thought what's the better deal here Amen. and if those things are true then it's obvious what the better deal is he that laughs last, laughs longest. Now we come to our story. That's all introductory. We come to our story of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11. And so if you'd like to turn back there, we want to notice some things about this very quickly. First of all, I want you to notice in the story that John the Baptist was servant to Christ. He was a servant of God. It was John the Baptist right at the very beginning uh, at the Jordan when Jesus came and he lifted up his voice and he probably pointed and he said, Behold, which means look, hey, look, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist knew Jesus. In fact, he was his, I think, second cousin. Um, his mother and Mary's mother were cousins, so I guess they were second cousins, but um, he knew Jesus, but somehow God had revealed to John who Jesus was, that he was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And it was also the John who said, I must decrease, or sorry, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. He, uh, you know, John came first. He was the forerunner. Jesus mentioned that here. He was the introduced Christ. But once Christ was introduced, then John's ministry was to decrease and Jesus' ministry was to increase. Who baptized Jesus? <laughs> you know, if a Baptist if a Baptist baptized Jesus, that's that's good enough for me, you know. But anyway. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way, okay. Um, but he baptized Jesus. All I'm basically saying is this this was a servant of God. John was a great man. For the Lord, he is a great servant of the Lord. In fact, if you look at verse 7, uh, Jesus continues uh, the rest of the story in verse 7. Um, As the disciples of John the Baptist were departing, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind. He says, What did you think of John? In fact, when John was preaching in the wilderness and you went out to see John, what was it that you saw when you went out there? Was it some sort of effeminate little weak person out there who was just uh, bending with the wind and, and whatever, the, whatever the philosophies or the politics was of the day was this way and he was that way and he was weak and he was wallowing back and forth? Is that what you saw in John? No, that was not what you saw in John. You saw an oak tree who was strong and tenacious and stood strong for and against very, very uh, strong opposition. I want you to notice verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison, John the Baptist was in prison. <laughs> I had a man call me from prison today, uh, this morning, before I came out of the house. And uh, I had a little conversation with him. And, um, 
And he says, what are you preaching on this morning? I says, well, I'm preaching about John the Baptist in, in prison. So it was kind of interesting what, uh, the conversa- how the conversation went. Um, but the reason John was in prison is because Herod Antipas, his brother Philip, had a wife. And old Herod Antipas take, uh, took a, a, a shine to this woman and started dating this woman and then had a relationship this, the, with this woman who was not his wife and he was going to marry his brother's wife. And John the Baptist came along, stuck his finger in his nose and said, it is not lawful for you to have her. And Antipas took him through him in jail. And later on, when the damsel danced and said, uh, he said, you can have whatever you want. And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. John lost his life because he was not weak, but he was tenacious. He stood strong. This was a servant of God. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this part is because of what's coming next. Because John had a failure. His faith faltered. But I want you to see who it was. Uh, John was tenacious. Look at verse number 8. He says, But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Is that what you saw in John? Oh, John, he was dressed in camel hair. (laughs) That probably didn't smell too good, I would think, for starters. And it probably wasn't very soft. Um, They were an, an, uh, an animal skin like that, a camel skin. And then he wore a leathern girdle and he ate wild honey and locusts. This was a man's man. John the Baptist was not effeminate in any way, I can tell you that. He was tough. John was tenacious. John was tough. In verse 9 we see that John was true. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yeah, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. And then in verse 11, to cap all of this off, Jesus says concerning John, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He says, John the Baptist, there's nobody greater than John the Baptist as far as the service of God is concerned. There's no greater prophet than John the Baptist. He is right at the top. That's what Jesus thought of John the Baptist. John was servant to Christ. Secondly, in verse number three, we see that John was skeptical of Christ. He was a servant to Christ. But in verse three, we see that John was skeptical of Christ. Now, this absolutely blows your mind. Because here's one who is a prophet of God, the very best of the prophets of God. And in verse number three, he sends his disciples down. By the way, his disciples were just at Nain. And what happened at Nain was there was a funeral procession and there was a widow woman, a very pure woman. She only had one, one family member, her son, and her son had died. And there he's being carried in the bar in the coffin through the city. And in those days, they didn't have a, a lid on the coffin. I remember when I was in Romania and I saw a body being carried through the streets of Timisoara, the, uh, the second largest city in, Tim- uh, in Romania. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the undertakers came to pick this guy up, and there was no top on the coffin. And I was just, I was, and they were, we were in the, the in the street, and they just basically walked by this guy in the coffin, and, and I could see his whole body and his face and everything. And so Jesus saw what was going on. The woman was crying her eyes out, lost her only son and her only income. Yeah. When Jesus saw her, he had compassion, and he went over to the coffin. Carried on the man's shoulders and he just touched the bar. He touched the coffin. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? He just touched the coffin and the, and the boy, young fella, sat up right in the middle of the coffin and started talking to him. Oh, wouldn't you like to see that? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, the disciples of John saw that and they went back to John and they told John what was happening. But for some reason in John's mind, it still wasn't Jave and it still wasn't what he was expecting. And so he sends these two disciples in verse 3 and said unto him, said to Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? 
You see, John had expected the kingdom of God to come. They were preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God in Daniel and in Isaiah and in the Old Testament was that Christ would come as the king. He would be crowned king and sit upon the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. And everybody would bow. Even all the Gentile nations would bow to Christ. Because he's not only the king of Israel, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. But John's looking around in year three and now none of it's happening. In fact, Jesus is being rejected. And John is now in Herod's prison. And so he has these questions. He's having a crisis of faith. Yeah. He says the Bible says one thing, but reality is saying something else. Yeah. And so he goes to Jesus and he says, now, let me ask you this. Are you the one? That was the cup. Now, this is the very guy that said, Behold the Lamb of God. And he says, But now he's questioning, yeah. he's doubting. And he says, Are you the one that should come, or do we look for another? Mm. Now, I've said this before there's two words for another in the New Testament in the Greek language. One is another of the same kind, alos. Another, there's another word, another of a different kind, which is the word heteros. And so heteros means a different kind. Okay? And the word that is used here is heteros. Are you the one that is, was to come? Or should we look for another of a different kind of Messiah? One who comes on the white horse. One who comes as king of kings. One who's coming with power and glory to rule and to reign. Do we look for another one? Because I'm looking at you, Jesus, and it's not happening here. This wasn't what John was expecting. And it was causing... Skepticism and doubt. His faith was faltering. Let me ask you something. Has God ever allowed something that you didn't expect to come into your life? And I wasn't expecting that. And see, it's not just that. It's almost like, it's like God is doing something contrary to what we believe about him. It's like God is doing something different than what his nature should dictate. Peter would have thought, well, you know, when I got out of the boat, <clears throat> I, I, really wasn't, <clears throat> I wasn't expecting to sink. But down I went. I wasn't expecting that. I was just expecting to get out and walk to Jesus. But I was halfway out there. I started singing. I didn't expect that. And Martha and Mary said, well, we knew that Lazarus was sick. But we weren't expecting them to die. And the disciples said, well, he, we believe he's the Messiah, the King of Israel. We have found him of whom Moses and the law and prophets did write. But he died. And when he died on the cross of crucifixion, their whole world was shattered. We didn't expect that. Can I tell you that that has happened in some of your lives already? Yeah. And can I tell you it can happen again? Before we get out of here, there's going to be things that happen that you're not expecting. And you don't like it and you don't want it. I know that. But it's almost like, well, this is not what you promised, Lord. Now, we've got to be careful about what God promises because he's very, very truthful. Sometimes we think he's promised things that he hasn't. Right. He's told you. In this world you shall have, you'll have tribulation, you'll have persecution. Now, the question as I close here is this. Was John's salvation at stake here because of these questions? Was his security in jeopardy? Let me ask you something. Do you think that God's mad at you this morning? No. But you know... When things happen that you don't expect and things happen that are like real trials to your faith and things that you really, really didn't want to happen and you're thinking, Lord, I was expecting you to protect me. I was expecting you to give me, you know, happiness and, and blessing. And Lord, are you mad at me? Lord, are you disappointed in me? I have so many more scriptures to get out here and I don't have time to. But you know the scripture says in the book of Isaiah that he will not fail nor be discouraged. Do you know that God never gets discouraged? Do you know that he, wa he knew what I was before he ever saved me? I, I just I quoted it the other week. I says when God calls somebody to be a preacher, he knew you were an idiot before he called you. <laughs> and he still calls you anyway, right? You know, preachers are not, um, you know, in a different class or something. We are made of flesh and blood and we have problems and trouble just like you do, you know. See, God chooses to use people who are just available. 
Now, what does Jesus do with John here? And I'm coming to my last point here in just a second. But in verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Well, what were they hearing and seeing? Well, verse 5, the blind received their sight, the lame walked, the lepers were cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. That happened just a moment ago in the city of Nain. The dead are raised. The poor have their, the, the, the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And blessed means if you're happy, you're happy if you don't allow the things that, that happens. You know, there's, there's hard things that Jesus said and his disciples no longer walk with him. Sometimes there's things that will happen in your life that, that will bring offense. The word offense means a stumbling block, something that will stop you. There's many people, I believe in true saved people, are not in church today because they, they were offended. They got, they, they tripped over something. They were offended. They, they, there was a stumbling block that stopped them. And there's no blessedness in that. You'll not be happy. The only person who's happy is in spite of the hard things. In spite of the things we don't understand. We just continue on anyway. Uh, John, you may not understand what's going on here. But if you just trust me, you'll be blessed in that. Okay. So what Jesus did was he just simply reminds John of the facts in verse number 5. And these were all fulfillments of Old Testament prophecies. We won't have time, but Isaiah 50, sorry, Isaiah 35, verse 3 to 6, Isaiah 61, verse 1. It tells you all those things, the lame would walk, and these are all uh, marks of the king and the kingdom. And by the way, we need to know also what the facts are. No matter how you feel, no matter what your emotions are telling you, when the Bible says something, it's a fact, it's true, whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, you see, the thing is, because things don't feel right, we think they aren't right. right, right. Not true. On the other hand, people think because it feels right, it's got to be right. Not so. How do you know if it's right or wrong? Thy word is truth. Amen. The Bible. So Jesus reminds them of the truth. And so we also need to be reminded. That no matter what our emotions might be screaming at us, the truth always stands. Yes, yes. Now here's the interesting thing about this whole thing. John was servant to Christ and he was skeptical of Christ. But in verse number 11 we see that John was secure in Christ. Because verse 11 is amazing. <clears throat> and we just read verse, from verse 7 onwards... He's commending John. John wasn't a weak, wimpy uh, reed blown in the wind. He was an oak tree. He was tenacious. He was strong. He was courageous. He was tough. He was truthful. John was brilliant. In fact, I tell you what, he was the best of the best. He says in verse 11, Among them that are born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now, there are others that were on the same level, but nobody better than John. <clears throat> Jesus just gave us here his opinion of John. And Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist is, he is at the top. There's nobody higher. There's nobody greater than John. He's the bee's knees, as Brother Eric Bowman always says. Top drawer. He's top drawer. John the Baptist is right at the very top. Now I want you to get the picture. Where is John? He's languishing in a prison. In modern day Jordan, across the Jordan Valley, south of the Dead Sea, out in the wilderness. You can still you go there today and you'll see the, the prison of, um, of Herod Antipas. It's still there. And that's where John the Baptist was. And he was probably thinking to himself. Thinking, now get your, heart, get your, your mind into the mind of John the Baptist at this point in his life. This is the lowest point of his experience. One who was filled... With the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. But this is the very low point. And he's probably thinking to himself. There's nobody lower than me right now. There's nobody who's failed in ministry more than me right now. I'm powerless. And even now my faith is. I'm faithless. I've, I've not believed in the one who has come. His faith had faltered. No doubt in my mind he was sad. Very sad. Felt lonely, felt depressed, possibly for, forgotten about. You know, Jesus is the King of Kings and there's going to come a time when uh, there's no prison bar will hold him or any of his own. 
In fact, it's kind of interesting. He's coming to that place called Bat on our studies on Sunday nights. You remember the, the, the place prepared for the woman, the Israel in Jordan? It's actually the same place where John the Baptist was. And when Jesus comes, he releases those prisoners first on his way uh, to Jerusalem at the Battle of Armageddon. Um, and so he releases them. But he didn't come to release John. John stuck there, forgotten about him. And yet, that's how he was feeling. And yet, reality and truth is that he, at that moment, was one of God's very best in Jesus' opinion. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Look at verse number 7. And as they departed... So here's the disciples of John the Baptist coming to ask Jesus this question, relaying this question, are you the one that should come? Should we look for another? And Jesus said, you know, uh, go back and tell John what, what you're seeing. What's happening? You know, uh, the deaf are hearing, the blind are seeing, all that. Um, and so they turn around and they start walking back down the road to go to tell John what Jesus had said. And as soon as they have left, in verse number 7, Jesus starts telling the crowd all these wonderful truths about John the Baptist. How much different would it have been if Jesus had to said, Hey, you guys here, just sit down here a wee minute. Just, for, just wait here another 10 minutes. Let, let me tell you and the rest of these people what I think about John. And the, the disciples of John the Baptist would sit down and they would hear these wonderful words of Jesus. And they could go back to John the, uh, the Baptist and say, you'll never believe what Jesus said about you. He said you were top drawer. He said there was nobody greater than me. But John never got that message because his disciples left before Jesus told them that message. <clears throat> Think of what that would have meant to John to hear those words of Jesus. And yet, and, you know, and Jesus knew what he was doing. He could have stopped them and let them hear, but he let them go because Jesus allowed John to fight that fight of faith in that moment by himself. Because I'm going to tell you something, sometimes you have to stand by yourself and you have to fight through those things and just trust God. You may be, dis yeah. you may be depressed this morning. Because of your trials. Or you may have doubts and fears and questions. You may have had questions in your heart about the Lord for years and years. And it has discouraged you. It's become a stumbling block in your life. And you might even be here this morning and think to yourself, you know, I'm the worst person in here. That's what John thought, really. I'm the worst. And the, be the truth be told, God's very upset with me. And God doesn't think a whole lot about me. Because my faith is very weak and I, 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 I disagree with what has happened and I don't like what has happened and I'm kind of fell out with God about it and I, I, my faith is very, very weak. And God's surely frowning upon me. And what you really don't realize this morning is actually God is smiling on you. God is smiling on you. You're like John the Baptist back here um, in all the turmoil and all the negativity and all the sadness and the loneliness and the, all the questions and all the doubts and all the fears. And Jesus is over here with a smile on his face. He's not discouraged. He's John, he's, he's top notch. What a beautiful morning it was this morning coming to church. The sun is shining. See, in Ireland it doesn't shine a lot. It rains a lot. So I love the, the climate here in Tennessee. I love the. Do you know the sun is shining bright? But just a, even yesterday or a few days ago, it was so dark and cloudy. I mean, you could feel the darkness. It was just terrible. It was raining. But you know what? On those darkest, cloudiest day, the, the sun shines just as bright as it is today. Did you know that? It's just that you can't see it. And just because you're under the weather with the clouds and of all the questions and doubt and sadness in your life, the gloominess and the darkness, can I tell you something? God is still smiling. God is still shining. It's just that you can't see it. John the Baptist, if you could just know what Jesus thought about you. But he didn't know it. But one day he would. One day he would. 
Jesus said to Peter, what I, what I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. I'll close with this thought. And, and I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how I get these messages. Just, I mean, I'm reading the Bible and the Lord just puts things on my heart. But I was reading a biography about Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, in the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and one of the greatest preachers the world has ever known. Prolific writer, tremendous speaker. They would take his sermons and put them in the newspapers in London, and they sold hundreds of thousands of them. But you know, he had a lot of health problems. And the only relief, to get away from the, the rain and the cloud of London, they would send them to the south of France, a place called Menton. It's a beautiful place, right on the French-Italian border. And they would go down there, especially in the winter months, and they would get some relief. He had gout, and he had all kinds of problems, health problems, lots of pain and everything. But you know the Spurgeon battled with depression? For over 20 years, he battled with depression. One of the most successful preachers in the world, and yet he was depressed. He would preach to thousands, they'd be depressed about it because of the responsibility he had. So it came time when he was going to die. And he went to Menton in the south of France. And his, his um, it wasn't a servant, it was his friend, but his helper that went with him. And I remember, I, can't, I was trying to look for the, the, the book there this week. I think a, a lot of my books I gave away and I don't know who's got them. But anyway, but in that biography, it was noted that the, the friend of Spurgeon who was with him in his dying hours said that it was a very distressing time. He, he had pain from gout, but he, the, the thing that, that took his life was really kidney failure. And I remember when my father died. It's a very distressing time. But not only distressing physically, but Spurgeon really wrestled spiritually in his last moments. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm really hoping and praying that when I'm, when I'm about to die, when my daddy was dying, we had him in the living room and we had songbooks and we were singing hymns around his bed. And if I was dying, I'd like for some of you to come, the ones that are still left, to come to my house. And if I'm in my bed and you just sit around and take songbooks and sing songs, I would just love that. Yes. And I would love for you to be praying when I'm dying. I would love to know that when I'm dying, that it's just a sweet experience, that there's faith and, and expectation as we walk through that veil into the presence of the Lord, what a glory it's going to be. Yes. But Spurgeon didn't feel that way. And I remember Rich Fulton, Linda was here, his wife, just a few weeks ago. And Rich is one of the most buoyant, happiest Christians I've ever known in my life. But you know, he also was down with cancer and he had a very rough passing as well. And questions. What about when it come, comes time for you to die and it's not really a happy experience and you're going through a rough time with that? Can I tell you this? It's the facts that matter. And no matter how you are dealing with that experience, when the Lord calls you and you enter into his presence, there's nothing but sunshines and smiles Amen. and hugs and everything that he has promised, no matter what you feel or no matter what you doubt about that, makes no difference. Yeah. When you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And my friend, and I studied it out many, many times. What it is for a Christian to die. You know, Jesus is not worried about you, Dan. He wasn't worried about Lazarus, Dan. And old Jacob, when he was Dan, he wasn't worried about it. He talked to his boys and then he just, the Bible says, he, he put his feet up into the bed and he gave up the ghost. There's nothing to worry about. Not because of your great faith or your great perseverance or because of your hanging on or your trying. It's got nothing to do with that. It's got all to do with his promises. Yes. Amen. He will keep his promises. That's right. And you have nothing to worry about. But you know what? We still worry. Yeah. We're still like John over in the dungeon. Sad and lonely. Woe is me. I'm the worst of the worst. And God is not smiling at me. And the opposite was actually the truth. Our hope is in God. And let me tell you something, when your faith falters, it's not your faith that's, that, that, that's that not your continued faith or your, your perseverance and, and uh, holding on to him that, that's going to deliver you. He is the one that will keep his promise. Many scriptures we didn't read this morning, but I want to finish with just two. First of all, 
Peter said in Second Peter, or sorry, Paul said in Second Timothy two thirteen, if we believe not, now listen to this, if we believe not, for faith falters, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And the verse that has ministered to me over and over and over again is this. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27. It's in your bulletin. The eternal God is thy refuge. Now listen. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Amen. Underneath are the everlasting <laughs> arms. You think you're fallen. And you may be fallen. But there's somebody who's going to catch you. God's got you. Yes. And every one of our stories, all of them, end well. Romans 8, we're kind of the sheep for the slaughter. Nay, 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 nay. And all these things were more than conquerors through him. I'm telling you, you're victorious, you're secure, you're safe. Underneath are the everlasting arms. You know why I'm telling you all this today? First of all, because it's true. But I believe that it'll bring a relief to you and it'll bring love to him. Look to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you.